Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible. Turn to Isaiah chapter 60. This is going to be the continuation of the Isaiah commentary series. For as long as the tube allows me to stay on the air, anyways, um, boy, I tell you what, a lot of channels getting destroyed by the tube. Lord's hand must be protecting the channel for now. So, let's go to chapter 60, Isaiah, and verse 1. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy, for thy light is come. And Christ is the light of the world, right? And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. So there's going to be a spiritual darkness but there's also going to be a physical darkness. Right now we're in a spiritual darkness, but prior to the coming of the Lord, the Bible speaks of when the Lord will make the world dark, not just physically, I mean spiritually, not just spiritually, but dark, physically also. Now, you could read about the crucifixion. When Christ was being crucified, it was it was dark for hours. I think like three hours. Now, what about the just prior to the coming of the Lord? Well, in Joel, the, the minor prophet Joel, uh, it's called a minor prophet, not because of the importance of the message, but rather the size. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now, there's a lot of people who try to tell you that the day of the Lord and day of Christ is two different events. Oh yeah, the day of Christ is the pre-trib rapture, and then the day of the Lord, well, that's the day of God's wrath when he comes back to punish the wicked. But my opinion, if you ask me, um, by saying the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is two different events, basically they're denying that Christ is Lord. That's my opinion. So... For the day of the Lord cometh, it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness. Ah, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. You know, remember, Egypt was covered with darkness before the Passover. And it happens in the book of Revelation, too. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, and there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. And then after the day of darkness, verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. So keep this in mind. Darkness and then after the darkness comes a flame. I mean, this is like, this is, this is what happened in Egypt. This is what is prophesied in the book of Revelation. I mean, you know, people just, you know, they don't, I, I don't know. It's just, they just don't make the connection. Now, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 22, the, uh, I'll keep this in mind, the plagues of Egypt in Moses' day are resembles 
in a lot of ways, the plagues of Revelation. Exodus 10.22 And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Uh, in verse 21, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. And then in Exodus 9.24, So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. In other words, it never happened before. All right, how about, uh, let's see. Well, yeah, and then in the verse before that, Exodus 9, 23, uh, it said, And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire, and the fire ran upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Uh, let's see. In Revelation 8, verse 5, and the angel took the censer and filled it with the uh, filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail, hail and fire mingled with blood. See, just like Egypt. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. Huh. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Didn't the waters in Egypt become blood? Oh yeah, they sure did. And uh, what came out of the side of Christ after he was crucified when the centurion, the Roman centurion, put a spear and pierced his side? What came out of his side? Water and blood. Why water? Well, you know, after you die, your heart is a pump. It's basically a mixer. And your blood is red because of the red blood cells. But your water, you know, there's water in your blood too. And because the heart is pumping, keeping the blood cells and the water mixed, you know, it's it's mixed up. It's mixed. But when you when your heart quits and you quit pumping blood, well then the water separates from the blood, the, um, the red blood cells. The red blood cells are heavier and they will sink to the bottom, but the water will float to the top. So that's why water and blood came out. He, he was dead. The centurion, you better believe a Roman soldier knows when people are dead. I mean, these people were, you know, battle-hardened soldiers. And Jerusalem was one of those most troublesome places for Rome. And the Christians, too, by the way. Now, how about Luke 23? Uh, Jesus be, is in the cru uh, being crucified. And uh, let's see, Luke 23, verse 42. Uh, one of the thieves was speaking to Jesus, right? And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
See, the, the thief on the cross called him Lord. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness. And there was a darkness over all the earth. That's right, when they crucified Christ, the light of the world, they killed his physical body. Of course there'd be a darkness, right? And there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. Oh yeah. What does Paul write in Ephesians 6.12? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, yeah. And then in uh, Revelation 16.10, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues. They gnawed their tongues for pain. And his kingdom was full of darkness. Now, let's take a look at Revelation 2. This is not really related to this Bible study, but I wanted to mention this. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. First death is physical, second death is spiritual. You know, uh, those of us that are faithful, endureth to the end, and faithful, and that overcome, we won't be hurt of the second death. They might kill the body, but they're not going to kill the soul. And verse 12, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Where's Pergamos? Pergamos was a city in Greece until the Ottoman Turks, those peaceful, loving Muslims, went in and killed all the Greeks. And I'm being sarcastic, by the way. Uh, the Ottoman Turks went in and killed all the Greeks. And then they renamed the area they conquered. They called it Turkey. So Turkey used to be called Greece until those peace-loving Muslims went in and killed everybody. And that's where, guess what, Pergamos is in Turkey right now. So let's, let's read this. Keep that in mind. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Wow, Pergamos. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. I guess that's saying that's, that's where Satan's throne was, Pergamos, which today is modern-day Turkey. Is there going to be an Islamic connection to all this? I think so. Even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. All right, there we go. Now, book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. This is an end times prophecy chapter, people. You know, I think there's more prophecy in the Old Testament than there is in the New. And that's why your demon nominational preachers will tell you, oh, don't read that. We're in a different dispensation. Uh, don't, you know, that's for the you-know-whos. That's not for us. Oh, really? Joel 2.29 And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids 
handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Isn't that what we read in Exodus? Isn't that what we read at the crucifixion? Isn't that what we read in Revelation? Yeah. You know, the Lord does, you know, he's got a, he, he shows you in the Old Testament what he's going to do in the New Testament. The Old Testament was a shadow of things to come. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. How about Zephaniah, another minor prophet? Uh, now there's a Zephaniah and there's a Zechariah. You want the Z-E-P-H-A-N-I-A-H. So, uh, let's see. How about verse Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14? The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet. Remember, there's seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, right? A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced city and against the high towers. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 60. Ah, uh, Let's start at the beginning. Verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles, the nations, shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see all they gathered themselves together. They come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Nibaloth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these that fly as a cloud, and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles, surely the isles, shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first. Now, Tarshish is a, an old, old name for Spain. I mean, let's face it. You go, you know, along the Mediterranean and you got Spain all the way to Israel, the land of Israel and the land of Egypt. And you got Italy, you've got Greece. So, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring my sons from far, 
their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Oh yeah. The God gives the Lord gives you a spanking, but then the Lord will have mercy upon you. Verse eleven. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their king their kings may be brought. Now I believe this is in reference to uh, New Jerusalem. They the, the gates just will never be closed because I mean the Lord Himself is going to be protecting the city of New Jerusalem, so why would you need to close the gates? Just my opinion. Verse twelve. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the palace, I'm sorry, the, um, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. In other words, they're going to be bowing. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Is there a New Testament companion verse to this? Oh, yeah. How about Revelation chapter 3? Verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Verse 9. Here's the punchline. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are you know whose, and are not, but do lie. Behold, behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. See, God is going to try them. He's, they're going to, it's a test, you know? Uh, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Isaiah 60, 14, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. Revelation 2, 3, 9. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. 
Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breasts of kings. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass, and for stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace, and thine extractors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in, the, in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall no more the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Is there a companion verse in the New Testament? Of course there is. Revelation twenty one twenty three, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Should I read John eight twelve? Uh, no need to. Revelation twenty two and verse five, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. Oh, let's see. Let's go back to Isaiah 60 and verse 19. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. And thy, and thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. The people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation." I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. You know, in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 6, where it says, They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Well, what's the 60th book of the, New, of the Bible? It's 1 Peter. What does 1 Peter chapter 2 say? Well, in verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises, ah, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow. Wow. Pretty intense, huh? I hope that everybody's getting something out of this series. I'll tell you what, by the time I do my research and kind of throw together what I'm thinking about saying and everything, and I, I'm learning a lot myself. You know, every time I read the scriptures, I find something new that I didn't know before. So, you know, spend your time in the scriptures instead of the television. There's going to come a day when you won't be able to buy Bibles. Uh, it's it's terrible. It, but it's coming, people. All right. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world in His precious name. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in the name of mighty name of Jesus, world without end, amen.